how banks create deposits and reserves. In the banking system, loans create deposits. That's how you say it. Loans create deposits. What does that mean? It means if I go in to buy a house, you're just trying to sell your house for, uh, we're in New York, right? <laughs> Better raise the price. Uh, two and a half million dollars. I usually say two hundred fifty thousand dollars. You go to sell your house for two and a half million dollars, and I, I want to borrow the money from a bank to buy it. So I'm going to borrow two and a half million dollars. My credit's pretty good. So what does the bank do? The bank grants me the loan. They approve the loan for two and a half million dollars, and at the and they give what they do is they give put two and a half million dollars into my account which immediately goes into your account. I don't get to do anything with it except buy your house, okay? So the two and a half million dollar loan is an asset for the bank. An asset is something the bank has, something it owns. They make a loan, I sign, I promise to pay it back. They have my promise to pay money. That's worth something, that's an asset, okay? And they put two and a half million dollars in an account, in a checking account. That's a liability, which means the bank promises to pay that money or to pay that money, okay? Notice the loan created the deposit. They did not go to the Federal Reserve. They did not go anywhere. The Federal Reserve doesn't even know they did this. The two and a half million then, you sold your house to me, it goes into your account, and let's say we're all at the same bank. Okay. So now the bank has a loan from me. I owe the bank two and a half million, and there's two and a half million dollars in your account. You just sold me your house. You've got the money, I've got the house, the bank has a mortgage. Nobody has gone anywhere near the Federal Reserve. The money was created, the, that deposit was created as a matter of accounting, out of thin air, the system's in balance. You have two and a half million in your savings. My savings is negative. I have a loan. I owe two and a half million. Your savings went up. Mine went down. The net is zero. That's how they say it. Two and a half million loan, two and a half million deposit. Now, notice the bank created the money, the, the deposit, but it's not the bank's deposit. It belongs to you. You sold the house. You get to spend it, not the bank. The bank doesn't just take this and go spend it. Um, and, and one more thing happens, which is important to understand the sequence. If the Federal Reserve requires the bank to hold reserves, which and reserves are just checking accounts at the Fed. So if I can call reserves checking accounts at the Fed from now on for this discussion, is that okay? Okay. So if the if the Fed requires that you have a checking account at the Fed, your bank has a checking account for. And they use 10% because the math is easy. The real number is less than 1%. So we'll say 10%. And I'm supposed to have 200, there's a requirement that I take that two and a half million, I keep 250,000 at the Fed. As soon as I give you that deposit, my Fed account is now short 250,000. I'm supposed to have it there, but I don't, okay? What I have is an overdraft at the Fed. My account is lower than it's supposed to be. It's like if you have a minimum balance requirement at your bank and you don't have it, it's below your minimum. Okay. And so what that is, is and it's technically called an overdraft loan from the Fed. You don't have, the bank doesn't put that money up. That bank owes the Fed that money. It's an automatic overdraft loan. So what we have in banking, this is how it works. Loans create deposits, and they also create any reserves that the Fed might require in the first instance, there's simply an overdraft in your Fed account. You're short what you're supposed to have in your Fed account. Okay. Now, the traditional textbook says the Fed gives you money, you make loans, you decide, and it gives you this money multiplier. That is absolutely correct for what's called a fixed exchange rate system, which has been gone since 1934, so I'm not even going to talk about it. What we've had for our lifetimes is a system where the loans create the deposits and they create the reserves. And the old fractional reserve banking is perfectly correct. It's just for a different system. They still have it in Hong Kong. And they still have it in a couple of other places. But we don't have it here. And none of the other uh, uh, major countries have it. Okay. It all nets to zero. Deposits are necessarily equal to loans. If you've got $100 in a deposit, it's because somebody else borrowed the $100. Or you wouldn't have it. There's nowhere else it can come from. And I'm getting to why we have deficits, by the way. <laughs> but you need to know this. Okay, and the reserves are overdrafts. Okay. So as a matter of accounting, what they, the way they say it is assets equal liabilities, loans equal deposits. They have to because they come from the same place. If they don't, somebody at the bank has to stay late and figure out why his numbers don't add up. 
They will find you, usually, within a few dollars. Okay? And the other way it's said is that liabilities are the accounting record of assets. If you make a loan, the record of that is the deposit. It's the accounting record. It has to add up. Okay. Notice there are no net financial assets when this happened. Well, there are no what we call net financial assets. You can't have everybody with savings. Where would it come from? Savings has to come from somebody else's loan, which is negative savings. You owe that money. So everybody can't have $100,000. Somebody has to be, if somebody's plus 100000 somebody has to be minus 100000 in monetary terms. It can't come from anywhere else. It's called, in, the, the textbooks used to call it a case of inside money. The Italians called it giros, you know, in the 12th century. Debits, credits, one comes from the other. It has to net to zero. Okay. okay, so the only way we could have any net savings, where everybody could have some savings, or the savings could be higher than the loans, is if they came from outside the economy. It has to come from the outside. We can't generate it inside. If, you want to save, if somebody gives you money and you want to save it, he would have had to have borrowed it. It has to lower his savings. It can only be transferred around. Net has to come from the outside, and that is the government sector. Okay? And that happens when the government spends more than it taxes. So we have the economy where loans create deposits, one person's savings is another person's loan. The only net savings, the only net dollars, the only net financial assets, all the same thing, can come from the government sector. Now, when I talk about the economy, I'm including residents and non-residents. You can live anywhere in the world. Not, we can separate it out where people in New York could be saving, and people in Connecticut could be borrowing, and people in Germany could be saving dollars, and people in France could be borrowing dollars. I'm the whole economy outside of government. Okay. So, we're going to give an example here of how that works. If the government were to spend a billion dollars and not tax it, it does it by crediting somebody's account. It changes a number up. Now the system has a billion dollars more than it had before. It's really that simple. And the way we say it is total net financial assets of the non-government sector are a billion dollars higher than otherwise. Okay? And there's an accounting identity for that. It's called the government deficit equals the non-government surplus to the penny. The government deficit equals the savings in the economy of dollars to the penny. So last year, this year, the government deficit is $1.2 trillion. It spent $1.2 trillion more than it taxed. It added $1.2 trillion more to our accounts than it subtracted. When it spends, it adds. When it taxes, it subtracts. Our savings, the whole economy, worldwide, global dollars, went up by exactly $1.2 trillion to the penny or somebody in the general accounting office has to stay late and find his mistake. Because when they change the numbers up, in all the accounts in the world, they have to all add up to the 1.2 trillion, to the government deficit. So why does this matter? Okay. It matters because, in general, the economy has a very strong desire to net save. Why do we have this strong desire to save? It's built into the institutional structure. It's built into the legal structure. We have requirements that will say 15% of your paycheck gets taken away. You never get to spend it. It goes into your pension fund. Okay? We say if you put money in your IRA, you can do that and not pay taxes on it until you take it out. It's a very powerful incentive not to spend your income, to save. And it may not be your savings that you have immediate control, but your business is doing it for you. We have very strong incentives for our corporations to keep very high cash savings. Apple has over $100 billion in their, in their account. Okay. Um, and I list some of them here. Pension fund contributions, earnings that our pension funds earn, corporate reserves, IRAs, and all the other savings vehicles. All the cash in circulation, right? And foreign central banks save tremendously. We have central banks, foreign banks, with you know, one, two trillion dollars sitting in their savings accounts at the Federal Reserve. Those are called Treasury Securities. Treasury Securities are just savings accounts at the Federal Reserve, nothing you need to worry about. So, 
we've got all this, all these reasons not to spend into all this institutionally driven desire to net save. Well, how can that happen? We can't possibly borrow enough buying houses and borrow enough buying cars and go into debt enough personally to fill up our pension funds. And so what I'm telling you is, and here's a number here, it's no coincidence that the federal deficit is something like $15 trillion, and there's something like $15 trillion in our pension funds. It's like, where else is it going to come from? Now, this is not to the penny. We could borrow some or not borrow. It changes in different years. But this huge number of 15, maybe be closer to 20 trillion now with the stock market, with a 15 trillion plus in pension funds has to be, that's a savings, it has to represent somebody else borrowing, spending more than their income, or else it isn't going to be there. Okay, so we've created the need for the government to spend more than its income by establishing all this institutional structure that establishes all these pension funds, automatic contributions, money being taken out of our income and put away. It can't come from anywhere else. Think of it as 16 trillion $1 bills. Where would it come from? The government has to spend it and not tax it or it can't get in there. 